We've all been negatively impacted by the strain supply chains over the past two years. Whether it's because of chip shortages or one ship stuck in the Suez Canal, shipping delays have become routine and expected. And I know you don't need me to tell you how annoying it's been. Things have been improving thankfully, but trade networks are definitely still in the recovery phase. And on February 6th of this year, we saw again how easily trade can be disrupted. The busiest bridge in and out of the U.S., partially blocked by truckers protesting vaccine mandates. The traffic nightmare. ...to the U.S. border, long lines of semis at the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit now. I understand that the backups are now moving even uh, onto I-75 uh, on, on the U.S. side. Resulting part shortage already forcing GM to cancel shifts today at a Michigan assembly plant. The blockade of the Ambassador Bridge instantly cut off the busiest border crossing between the United States and Canada. It shut down the route that carries at least 25% of annual trade between the two countries and stopped the $300 million worth of goods that cross the bridge daily, crippling trade and creating major traffic jams on both sides of the border. The Ambassador Bridge is a critical piece of infrastructure, or as one journalist described it, it may be the most economically important one and a half miles of roadway in the Western Hemisphere, which is exactly why its closure not only gained international attention, but made many people ask, why is this bridge so important? And that's what I want to talk about today, to explain why the Ambassador Bridge is a vital part of trade between the US and Canada, and to hopefully understand why its closure was so disruptive. The first question that needs to be answered is why does so much trade between the US and Canada follow this route? That is what makes the bridge important after all. The reason the Ambassador Bridge is the busiest border crossing between these countries is because of where it's located. The bridge connects Detroit, Michigan on the American side to Windsor, Ontario on the Canadian side. Both of these cities have long histories as trade hubs because of their access to the Great Lakes and both still have active ports with ocean access thanks to the St. Lawrence Seaway. Plus, since they're only about 1 to 2 miles apart, which is about 1.6 kilometers to 3.2 kilometers for everyone else in the world, building a bridge or tunnel wasn't a major challenge here. These things gave the area a natural advantage for trade, historically and still in the present. And the way both countries developed only made this area more important. I know this will sound crazy, but Detroit is actually surrounded by a massive amount of people. Let me explain. Detroit's population is around 639,000 people, with about 4.3 million people living in the Detroit Metropolitan Statistical Area. A large amount, sure, but nothing too crazy. But zoom further out and it becomes easier to see why Detroit is in the perfect location for both the US and Canada. If you draw a circle with the 300 mile radius around Detroit, you'll find several other large cities in it, some in Canada and some in the US with Detroit nearly being the middle point between Chicago and Toronto. Over 51 million people live in this area across both countries, and they're already well connected through existing highways and railroads. And in the US, shorter trips already dominate the freight market, with trips under 250 miles making up 51.8% of freight hauled based on the value of goods shipped. Obviously, this is a bit smaller than the 300 mile radius of our circle, but you'd still cover 83% of this area, and it would still cover parts of Chicago and Toronto. These things make it easy to understand why so much trade flows through here, but it doesn't explain why so much of it travels on the Ambassador Bridge. Which brings us to the second question. Why does so much trade go through the Ambassador Bridge? It's mainly the result of the other border crossings in the city and the way freight is transported across the border. There are two other land crossings between Detroit and Windsor besides the Ambassador Bridge. The Detroit-Windsor Tunnel for road vehicles and the Michigan Central Railway Tunnel for trains. Both are key links for the countries, with the Detroit-Windsor Tunnel actually being the second busiest border crossing between the United States and Canada. But both of them have a low vertical clearance, which limits the type of freight that can go through them. And if you've ever seen videos of the 11-foot-8 bridge, you'll know just how much clearance matters. Let's look at the Detroit-Windsor Tunnel. The listed maximum vertical clearance is 12 feet 8 inches, more than enough for cars, and it can accommodate some trucks. 
but it's about a foot and a half lower than the 14 foot minimum recommended by the US federal government. So it's not an option for most semis or large trailers. It's a similar story with the Michigan Central Railway Tunnel. It's very active and owned by one of the largest rail companies in North America, transporting an average of 400,000 rail cars a year in the mid 2010s. However, the tunnel isn't tall enough for double stack container cars, and that was after it was expanded in the 90s. There was even a plan to build a new rail tunnel so large rail cars could cross through Detroit, but it was suspended indefinitely in 2015. So the original rail tunnel is still active, just with limits. It's hard to predict how much a new rail tunnel would be used, even if it was built, because a huge amount of trade between the US and Canada is carried by trucks. From 2015 to 2021, the number of trucks that entered Detroit from Canada was consistently in the millions, while the number of incoming trains was just in the tens of thousands. Even when you look at the number of containers, incoming truck containers consistently outnumber incoming rail containers. Now it's important that you know that this doesn't mean that trucks carry more goods than trains. There are ways to examine freight haul through things like ton miles or just by looking at the values of goods carried by each transportation mode. And this data doesn't show either of those things. But it does explain why the Ambassador Bridge is used so much. Because if there's millions of trucks that need to cross annually, and there's only one road they can take, it makes sense that it's used so much. Of course, this raises another question. How is there only one bridge in such an important location? How in an area with thousands of trucks crossing daily, is there only one route they can take? It's a messy mix of local politics and business interests, but I'll do my best to explain it. Residents of both Detroit and Windsor have been pushing for another crossing since the turn of the 21st century and most likely longer. All the crossings between the cities were old and built for a different time. And the nearest alternative was about 60 miles north between Port Huron and Sarnia. So the situation was understandably frustrating. The movement to build another crossing kept gaining popularity, with the binational study beginning in 2004, then later receiving environmental approval from the Federal Highway Administration in 2009. But there was strong opposition. One major source who disapproved of the plan was the Detroit International Bridge Company, the owners of the Ambassador Bridge. The company's owner, Manuel Maddy Maroon, shared why he didn't support the new plan shortly after it received federal approval, saying, adding more competition, especially when you have to get approvals from the same people who want to compete with you, strikes me as unfair and duplicitous. He also mentioned that he'd been working with officials on both sides of the border to build a new span next to the Ambassador Bridge since at least the 90s, and already invested $500 million for it. But in the same way Maddie Maroon didn't support the public bridge, much of the general public didn't support his plan. One reason for this was the proposed location. A new span next to the Ambassador Bridge would increase capacity, but it would still lack direct access to highways on the Canadian side, keeping truck traffic in part of a residential area and demolishing a historic neighborhood to make room for it. It would also still be privately owned, which was another concern for residents. The Canadian government already disapproved of Maroon's ownership, repeatedly challenging the company's authority and getting into legal battles with him since he acquired the bridge in the 70s. Many Detroit officials also had negative opinions about the company's management, with things reaching a boiling point in 2012, when Maroon and a company executive were jailed for contempt of court for not complying with the local judge's order to finish on-ramps for the Ambassador Bridge, something they were contracted to do since 2004. Others in the company disputed the judge's reasoning, saying it was more of a personal move. But either way, it was a clear example of the tension that existed between the city and the bridge company. This doesn't even begin to cover all the challenges that building a new crossing has faced. And with every attempt to build a public bridge, something has come up. But there is a bit of good news. Groundbreaking for a new bridge began in the summer of 2018, almost a decade after it received environmental approval. The Gordie Howe International Bridge will not only connect Detroit and Windsor, but it will be the longest cable stay bridge in North America when it's completed. It's still the target of litigation and has dealt with other complications, 
but the project is on schedule to meet its 2024 completion date. It's easy to see why the Ambassador Bridge closure was so impactful when you look at all of these factors. This is an area that's been essential for US-Canada trade for decades, and it will likely be just as important in the future. And this bridge has been one of the few connections that kept it flowing throughout that time. Thankfully, a new border crossing is being constructed for the first time in nearly a century. But even with the new modern bridge, we'll have to be careful about our over-reliance on a few key pieces of infrastructure, or risk ending up in a similar situation. Hopefully this video answers your general questions about the Ambassador Bridge, trade between the US and Canada, and the reason why it goes through the bridge. If you like videos about trade and logistics, you'll love this video I made on the JW Westcott Company. It's a small boat that delivers to cargo ships in the Detroit River, and I got to spend a day with the crew seeing it up close. There's a link to it in the description and at the end of this video. If you do have any more questions about the Ambassador Bridge, be sure to leave them in the comments and I'll try my best to answer them. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.